I joined as at the lowest rank of human life, which was a gunner, a supernumerary gunner. You're joining a 17th century army. If you aren't prepared to take commands on the field, don't join. I see myself as a musketeer fighting for what he believes in and um, fighting for freedom and what he wants. And you just feel really passionate about that idea. I'm a woman in my whole life, but for those few hours on the weekend, I can actually be a man. And I can move like a man, fight like a man, use swear words like a man, a real macho man. I've tried being a lower class whore. It just doesn't appeal to me being sort of scabby and dirty. I'm much more, um, I just feel much more upmarket than that. in the reenactments and the battles that we do, it's virtual reality. In fact, it's better than virtual reality. <laughs> That's after all manufactured. This is real. You're there. It's happening. Comes two to comes one. Comes two, go ahead. Roger, we have a ten year old male extreme pyrex here. When you're a foreigner in a country, you need to do something in order to get into the society. Otherwise, you stay amongst other Germans or foreigners and you don't get to know the English people very well. Hello. Hello. So, what can I do for you? Well, he's got a very sore throat. I think he's got a bit of temperature as well. I'm a doctor by profession. I started working here in one of the NHS hospitals. And initially, as a senior house officer, it was extremely hard work. Once I used to work 108 hours a week by contract. Now, in a certain way, I had to stay sane and I had to do something outside of my professional life, something as crazy and weird as possible in order to survive my work. I joined after finding out I was related to Oliver Cromwell. Um, my parents took me to Madame Tussauds in London where I saw a, a wax work of him. And my father told me then I was related to him, so I did research and um, studied the 17th century in the Civil War more. When I first joined the Sealed Knot, I had images of um, everybody taking it very, very seriously, everybody being in their 17th century kit every minute of the day and lived that to the full. And um, when I got there, I found caravans, tents, people walking around in civvy clothes and I didn't expect that at all. I thought it'd just be purely living history every minute of the day. Right. Can you sort me out at the back before you shoot off like you usually do? It's glamorous. It's romantic. It's exciting. It's stimulating and if you like me and I am although I'm a woman I'm very interested in military okay, I'm very interested in modern wars as well um, and when the Gulf War was on I was there early in the morning waiting for it to come on you know I was really into it The first event I did was a baggage training weekend and I had absolutely no idea of what sort of character to play and the baggage master said to me, well, what would you like to be? Um, you can go and open a whorehouse, he said to me. So everybody said that because my kit was far too upmarket, I'd have to be the brothel keeper. Whore so be needed... gone! Oh dear. And hand this man! He's a godly man! Be gone, no. minister! Be... And we had all the officers coming in. I, did, I had uh, a friend of mine called Gerbil who, who we were selling off for a groat as the bargain basement. Um, she's rather scabby. And then uh, 
a another friend of mine, Ellie, who was the fine, fresh-faced young thing from the country, and of course myself, who would of course only go with the officers. Sir, I have children to feed, I have business to make, now be gone. You can't serve God and mammon. You must away, it's like living a little fantasy world and getting away from reality and all the, the grist of, of having to pay the bills and having to support two children on your own, which is quite difficult. Away, sir. Damn you, Mother. sir. Thank you, Are sir. you both burn in hell? Better burning in hell than in heaven with you, preacher. Your soul's in jeopardy and you shall burn in hell. My mother was a little bit surprised at first to find out that I was playing a whore and said, did I have to actually do that? But to be frank, I've tried to explain to her, there would have been very few women following soldiers around that would have done anything else. And to pretend otherwise, unless you are a, a good wife of an officer, um, is actually quite oh, silly. Let it go! Let it go! I didn't do it! No! I chose a lower class for because, again, the restrictions are so much less than they would have been on the upper class. My partner, when you see him in kit, he's got masses of long hair and beard and nose, basically, and he doesn't look at all smart. So for me to play an upper-class whore would have meant I couldn't have associated with him. It's a lot of fun, and it's keeping in character with my partner. He acts as my pimp or my husband, depending on what we're doing. I can be as loud and vulgar as I want to, for example. I can go up to a man on the campsite, mostly my friends I hasten to add, <laughs> and say, hello, love, are you? What are you doing tonight? And things like that. I can be very uh, forward in a way I couldn't be in normal life, for example. My alter ego, my other half, if you like, he's more fun than I am. I've played as an upmarket horse, so I'm only particularly interested in officers and, and gentlemen. I mean, perhaps I might catch Prince Rupert's eye, who knows? Um, and then, of course, I'd be leading a life of luxury, so why should I? Why should I consider it to be looked down upon? I don't think so at all. It's a good way to earn a living. When I joined the Pike initially, I didn't think an awful lot about my strength. I thought I'm a wimpy, small, tiny woman. I can't do an awful lot. But uh, before I joined the Pike Block, I did some preparations. I went to the gym for a few months and I built my muscles up. And uh, when I went into the Pike Block, I suddenly thought, hey, I can do it. I think wearing a costume changes you anyway quite a bit. You might be wearing something really boring in your 20th century life. And then you suddenly go into something like this here, an armor. It makes you feel powerful. Let's say it like this, if you're usually shy and quiet and peaceful, and then you put the armor on, as I do now, you can become quite vicious. It changes people's personality quite a bit. I think the worst injury I had was actually when I was fighting as a musketeer. A musket book was swung round and hit me on the upper lip, where I ended up having three stitches. Anyhow, it would have broken my nose, and in lower, I'd have lost some teeth. Fighting on a horse, I've had a pike come through the front of the helmet and hit me in the eye, which caused the, the eyeball to bleed, and I had a really nasty black eye. When the Royalists and the Parliamentarian forces ride towards each other, we often collide, you nearly get your leg taken off or somebody else's horse hits you. So you do come out with bruises. The mail roll is, um, is great fun. One can go around and uh, be a bit patronising to the women and uh, some of the younger men. And it's tremendous fun. Most, most of the men play along with it. One or two of them occasionally forget and uh, address me in a female style. Uh, whereupon I say, my husband calls me sir, why can't you? Let's face it, the men are men. Uh, they're probably an officer on the field and a cavalier off the field, but that's it, they're a man. But we've got the best of both worlds because we can go on the field, get dirty, do all the things we enjoy doing, come off the field and be an attractive lady, woman, wench, whatever you want to be. And uh, the day on the field dressed as a fella has gone right out of the window and people look at you in a different light then. shy, tiny woman who doesn't like to 
give loud orders, then you can't become a commander. But uh, I like it when women are commanding officers. The only thing which makes me sometimes a little bit suspicious if, if a woman screams and squeaks really loud orders on the battlefield. And I sometimes think if I was a commanding officer, I would perhaps try to avoid that. Either I would try to get singing lessons or something like that to change my voice, to be able to scream really loud without squeaking. Or perhaps I would get a male <laughs> accompanying me and shouting for me. I think when we do a job, we do it the same as we do our housework. We do it thoroughly and we try and cover all eventualities. We're very bossy, if you like, and I think men sort of worry about this a little bit. Their male ego can be affected. I had no problem when I was Muster Master General. I'd ring them up and ask them to do some outrageous things. And I never once had anybody say, no, I'm not going to listen to you, you're a woman. They did as I asked, they accepted me for what I was and for my ability, not for my sex. But there were a few occasions when, as I was walking away, I would hear somebody say, who does she think she is, Maggie Thatcher? And I took that very much as a compliment. And I used to have a little smile to myself and think, yes, why not? She's a marvellous person to use as a role model. I'm planning to do living history in a few weeks' time and to be a woman for a whole week. Now, this is going to be fun because I've never been a woman before. So I have to learn how to do that. I have to learn how to walk like a woman, how to use women's costumes. And the best thing is I have to get a wig on because with my hair, obviously I wouldn't look like a 17th century woman. So I've got myself this beautiful wig with long blonde hair. I'm going to be a really beautiful woman with long blonde hair. Sometimes if I'm with friends, then perhaps we'll sort of laugh and joke and sort of, you know, oh, this isn't authentic, or that isn't authentic, the dreadful A word, everything's got to be authentic. And we do sometimes sort of go into the Tudorese type speech, which is the you are me dearie. <laughs> I read a lot of poetry from that era now. I'm quite taken with the Earl of Rochester, who has a lot of humour. You know, 40 men a day hath swived the whore, and yet the bitch still wags her tail for more. Another one about uh, Nell Gwynne at the time, um, which was hard by Pall Mall lived a wench named Nell. Twas there the king he kept her. She hath a trick to handle his prick, but ne'er lays a hand on his scepter, which alluded to the fact that she didn't interfere in the politics of the day. I carry all my stuff with me, so I've got my snapsack, cloak, spare footwear, which I've stolen from someone. <laughs> I've got my contraception, because I obviously don't want children, knife for eating, drinking and defending myself, and uh, my piss pot. <laughs> so I'm pretty much set up to go to town and earn a bit of money and then go and eat and drink in a tavern somewhere. side because I think really that's the only side we could be on. We're very much the royalist modern day. Uh, we joined the Sealed Knot because we were at the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. Um, we actually went to the royal wedding, Diana and Charles, in full costume, banquet suits the lot, with the children. We slept on the pavement. We were there for the celebrations, the carriages going past. We cheered, die. Um, we just loved the royal family. There was no question. Uh, obviously, we were going to be royalists. Cromwell, for me, is a very important person. After finding out I was related to him, I studied him in um, great detail and I read a lot of books about him and tried to empathise with how he felt and what he believed in. And although he, he didn't always get things right, far from it, I just feel so... Um, drawn to him and passionately about him. I actually carry a picture of him with me all times and um, I have one in my bedroom and uh, he's just with me all the time. It 
if hypothetically we were, they were to say, you know, you are going to be a parliamentarian, then I don't think we would actually be in the sealed knot because um, we are royalists and the question of turning to parliament would never occur to us. It's, it's just unthinkable. Well, I think Cromwell's got such a bad press most of the time. I mean, he gets the blame for the um, having King Charles's head chopped off and it wasn't his fault, all of it. I mean, he did really, really try and stop it going ahead. And he gets blamed for the um, Irish massacre, which, yeah, was a lot, of, um, a lot to do with him, but it was other people as well. And people think he's very ambitious and um, he was just out for himself. And he, he really wasn't, I don't feel anyway. Uh, raise your glasses to the new members of the Sealed Knot. You ready? Are you ready? Ah, raise your glasses. Ready? Say cheers. All our friends, practically all our friends, are members of the Sealed Knot. The in laws of Sealed Knot, the family Sealed Knot. You give it some. You give it some. My own daughter, she's, she's married, but her young man who wasn't in the Sealed Knot was told categorically, you know, join the seal knot or else. So he has to be very much part of the seal knot. The kids I used to dirty the phasers and stick rice krispies on, you know, because they got the pox. And I used to tie a rope round their waists and drag them around the crowd and uh, threaten to beat them if they didn't beg for money. My son Kieran will go off and work with a barber surgeon and he'll be leached or he'll be bled or he'll have bits amputated. On one particular occasion my eldest daughter was on the Living History encampment and some soldiers raided the camp at which point she sort of shrieked terribly loudly, oh no they've killed my mother, <laughs> don't let them hurt us. The little one still hasn't quite grasped it, she still thinks that we go and do the civil war <laughs> and that's about the extent. You, you get butterflies, your legs feel weak, um, you can hear the sounds of the horses, hooves, you can hear women screaming and you think to yourself, gosh, what's going to happen today? Because no two battles are ever the same. There is undoubtedly an atmosphere of excitement and tension, especially in the bigger battles of the war. You can feel the little tingle of expectation running around through all the ranks. After all the battles I've fought, I still feel incredibly sick and nervous. Sometimes we get on strange horses and we've no idea how they're going to react to the cannon and musket fire. So even if I know the horse, I'm still incredibly nervous. You've got to think that you are actually on the field and that guy opposite you wants to kill you. And so you've got to be scared. You've got to fight back. You've got to protect yourself. Run for it if necessary. Um, you've got to feel that you're part of a battle.
When I'm on an original battlefield, when I know that a battle has happened there 350 years ago, that sometimes creates very strong emotions in me. I mean, I had this on one occasion that I was actually crying on a battlefield because <laughs> during a battle we were reenacting because I was remembering what happened there 350 years ago. It's sometimes almost as if the souls of the people who died there are suddenly with me. It's a very emotional and weird feeling. You do feel a presence. It, it can be quite disturbing in a way, and you sometimes feel that perhaps we shouldn't be doing what we're doing because we might be mocking what actually happened at the time. And um, I, I do try and feel that Cromwell's there with me, um, telling me what to do. <laughs> but yeah, you, you do feel a, a kind of spookiness around you. When we did the Battle of Edge Hill, we actually uh, were formed up on the ridge and uh, we're waiting to attack the Parmaterians that were in the distance and um, all of a sudden the clouds came over and a flock of sheep, goodness knows where they came from, running across the field and a rainbow suddenly appeared from behind the Parmaterian troops and the whole thing looked so how you would expect. I mean, in those days, there must have been things like sheep getting involved in the battles and things. And it was so, as it should have been, that um, it was so eerie. I find it extremely difficult sometimes to get back into the 20th century to get out of role. I found myself sometimes sitting in the surgery and using words I would not usually use with my patients, just simply because my language had changed a little bit over the last three days in the 17th century. And I often still dream about being in the 17th century and I'm not quite with it for the first two or three minutes of the surgery, but that then changes pretty quick, I can tell you. I would have liked to have lived in the 17th century, provided I had money, because I think if you didn't have money, it would have been a very sad life for, for women in those days. I mean, I would have quite liked to have been Charles II's mistress, there we are. That, that would have appealed to me greatly. Of course, not Barbara Castlemaine. Uh, Nell, Nellie was much more fun. <laughs> Are we going down with them, Doug? We've got down with the checks, yeah? Go Sometimes I feel I'm more a 17th century person. Um, it's definitely nice to escape back to the 17th century and get away from the 20th century. I keep saying to myself, oh, I, I don't like all this modern equipment, you know, it'd be nice to go back in time and be in the 17th century and um, live as they live. But then you, I suppose you've got to think about the disease they had around and the ignorance uh, about certain things. So we're quite lucky in a way, but I'd definitely like to go back if I could. The more we hear about the future, the more uncertain things are. Um, there may be some very exciting things ahead, but when we look back, at least we know what happened. Um, we know what things were like to a certain degree, and uh, maybe there's a certain comfort in turning back and looking at them, warts and all. Civil War generally, well, it's daft, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, they, were, they had nine years of killing one another and it was completely unnecessary because Charles II was restored to the throne, things were put back as they were. Why did they bother? They really didn't achieve a lot. And in this present day, are they really achieving anything? Why don't they look back into the 17th century and realise at the end of the day, they're just wasting their time? There's a hot and steamy feel to next Thursday's programme as Women at Play visits the all-female Turkish baths in Harrogate. That's at 8 o'clock here on 4.